It's been roughly three weeks since my last episode on Nagorno-Karabakh. And would you believe it, it's almost three months, not exactly to the date, but almost three months uh, since the 9th of November uh, truce in 2020 was reached between Azerbaijan and Armenia with Russian mediation. So welcome to my latest episode on Nagorno-Karabakh number 14. Three months since an agreement was reached in Moscow and the discussions still continue in relation to the future both of Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh. A few nights ago, I was listening uh, to a lawyer, Arpine Hovannesian, delivering a set of scathing attacks on the current administration of Nicole Pashinyan in Yerevan. It was on one of the Armenian uh, channels. She's not the only one. Many other detractors have also expressed their viewpoints and suggested that uh, the prime minister is discredited and he should resign, not only try to call snap elections and try to ensure his own longevity within that political system. But there are also his supporters, people who think that he alone can deliver Armenia, move it forward, increase its democracy, and strengthen its institutions. So the argument is continuing. And at times, it gets quite rowdy. And at other times, it's more a question of reflection and exchange of views, a Socratic viewpoint. All this, by the way, is happening, let us not forget, when Armenia is not only dealing with political upheavals, but also suffers from coronavirus, from this pandemic that has basically impacted the whole world. We hardly ever hear about that outside the borders of Armenia, I suspect, but there are some 170,000 confirmed cases to date, if I'm not mistaken, with some uh, 3,000 deaths also. So today, given the political volatility in the country itself, given the coronavirus, given everything else that's happened, before I focus on the one point that I want to make in this episode, let me reverse the order of how I proceed usually and start by suggesting to you that I will be putting in the description box four links for articles or interviews that might perhaps uh, interest you. The first one discusses the landscape after the battle in the South Caucasus. Now, I know it's from the 15th of uh, January. So again, it's almost a month ago. For some people that is old news, but I think it's a very interesting discussion that Eric Hakopian of CivilNet TV has with Professor Yorgi Derlugian about the realities of today and the projection for the future. I'm also uh, putting another link, which is on misinformation and disinformation. I think the, the distinction between those two is quite interesting and quite valid actually. So I invite you uh, to watch that short interview as well. Then there is another one with Rafi Kasarjian, and this takes us into the frontiers of technology and the Armad airborne abilities that Armenia could develop in the future, not only in terms of uh, tools for war, but also in terms of helping society and the country itself. And last but not least, an article I spotted some one week ago entitled A New Patriotism, again by Eric Hakopian, that actually I think would be interesting reading uh, for you. 
Now, let me also make a point. Nobody has raised this with me from the viewers or the subscribers, but let me say it myself. You will have noticed that a lot of uh, uh, my links in the description box usually refer to Civil Net TV. That is not because I'm employed by them, nor am I here to sort of be their PR agent, but it's simply because I like some of their approach. I also watch and read, by the way, other sources. And when I do not, colleagues and friends of mine refer me to them. So I'm aware of what else is being written, but I also have a little bit of a tenuous history with Civil Net TV during the times when uh, Salpi Razarian now at the University of South California, uh, running the Armenian Studies Department. She used to run Civil Net TV, and I used to sort of do interviews and interact with her there. So there is a bit of a history, there is a bit of familiarity there as well. So bear with me, I will try and be a little bit more varied in the future. But let me come back to the one key point I want to raise in number 14. If I understand correctly, and here I go again, it seems that Civil Net TV has decided to do a set of interviews with some diaspora Armenians about their views on what happened in Gharapakh in Armenia, what is happening in Armenia, the shambolic realities of Armenia today, uh, politically and otherwise. And they had one of those already with a gentleman I didn't know at all, called Fred Tatlian from uh, the United States, from California, about the role and or the contribution of uh, diaspora Armenians post the latest war in the uh, Southern Caucasus. And he spoke quite a bit actually about the bot armies and cyber wars, which I thought was quite interesting. And this idea, this project of uh, actually having interviews with diaspora Armenians, I think is quite interesting and quite useful for people in Armenia, but also for, for people in the diaspora. Those who are in the know already realize that there is something called ADS, the Armenian Diaspora Survey which conducts uh, public opinion research in Armenian diaspora communities to inform the public about the issues, attitudes, and trends uh, shaping uh, the Armenian world in the 21st century. Now, this is not at all focused on the war in Gharapakh, nor the latest uh, volatility, but in general about attitudes of the aspirant Armenians toward Armenia uh, in our modern world. And it is a project that is administered by the Armenian Institute, which is a small but very promising and robust uh, institute here in London and is funded by the Kalust Gulbengian Foundation. I will also put, by the way, a link to the ADS. You might be interested in their annual surveys. But let me come back to my point, the diaspora and Armenia. If you look behind me, the image I chose today for this 14th episode emblazons the message that the diaspora is part of Armenia. And forgive me that it is not a good message. You probably can't read the whole message, but I'm not very tech savvy, and I didn't know how to reduce the size of the uh, message to fit the screen. So that's basically what it says. Uh, the diaspora is part of Armenia. And this has been something that has been going on for many years. I've spoken to many people who are far more uh, practically involved with Armenia in the diaspora, in France, in uh, Belgium, in the United uh, Kingdom, in Lebanon, uh, and elsewhere, who basically would say that there is a, a, an umbilical code that links the diaspora, in other words, Armenians living across the world outside the Republic of Armenia, or for that matter, outside Gharapakh, and the Republic, Yerevan, and the other towns and cities and villages as well. So there is that feeling that some people say our homeland, I call Armenia our spiritual homeland. 
It's not my homeland. I wasn't born there. I wasn't raised there. I didn't adopt the culture of that country. I do not speak with that country's dialect in Armenian. I speak with a Western dialect. So in a sense, I'm a product of uh, the Armenian genocide because my grandparents fled the genocide in 1915. And like me, many other Armenians found themselves across the Arab world, across Europe, and ultimately across uh, the United States, Australia, Canada, and elsewhere. So what is the link between this diaspora, people like me, people far, far more proactive than me, and people far less proactive than me, and the Republic itself. And this is an important point for CivilNet TV to put its finger on the pulse, because in general, there has been support for the independence and the welfare and well-being of Armenia, normal, I would say, by Armenian communities living abroad. But there have also been constructive criticisms across the decades. However, I feel that following the latest war in the Southern Caucasus, the one that happened some three months ago, that link between the diaspora and Armenia has weakened, has slackened. Why? Is it because diaspora and Armenians do not anymore believe, no longer believe in the viability and the validity of the Republic as an independent Republic in uh, the Southern Caucasus? Is it because they are uh, disappointed, frustrated, angry by what happened in Gharapakh and the loss of all those territories, some of which were occupied territories, by the way, the seven regions, but there were also territories within what Armenians call Artsakh that also went uh, back to Azerbaijan, uh, and I say back because it was with them before the 1990s, uh, such as Shushi or Shusha, for example, well, I think it has to do with the sense of frustration. It has to do with the sense of anger. It has to do with the sense of despondency, like what's going to happen. But this sense of frustration, despondency, anger, uh, loss of uh, knowing what to do and how to proceed forward is also something that has in the minds of some people generated an idea that Armenians as victims of a genocide, like other peoples who have suffered genocide, have this fear that, oh, they're out there to get us. It's going to be another genocide. That is also palpable from my conversations with some people who say, you know, this is the precursor of yet another uh, ethnic cleansing another crime against humanity, another genocide against Armenians to get rid of us and take over the rest of the Armenia uh, that exists today. I'm somewhat dubious of this. I understand some of those latent fears, but I'm a bit dubious about it. I don't think that we are there. I don't think in the 21st century with what's happening across the world, but also with social media, that anybody can commit genocide with the same impunity as was uh, acted out in uh, 1915 or during the First World War or the Second World War or even later than, uh, than that. And we can see that from the level of awareness of what has happened um, across many parts of the world with the uh, uh, Myanmar, uh, Burma on the one hand, with uh, China and the Muslim communities on the other. So social media platforms and connectability, connectivity, uh, global information makes that more difficult. What worries me more than this sense of foreboding and more than the anger and the frustration and the despondency, which are basically things that go up and then will come down after the passage of some time, and it has already been three months, is the breach of trust between the diaspora and Armenia. And that breach of trust would be serious because they are like two sides of the same coin. Armenians in the diaspora have helped 
critically perhaps, and they're right, they're entitled to be critical, have helped Armenia critically over the past decades. And Armenia itself has moved forward to be a progressive society that would make any Armenian anywhere in the world proud. But with the shenanigans happening now in Armenia, with the protests, with the uh, political games uh, and power plays that are being uh, observed across the world in Armenia, for those who follow these, uh, these matters like me or far, far more deeply than me, it is troubling. It is troubling because we see an Armenia that is self-absorbed, gazing at its own navel, trying to maintain its own power bases, having people who are trying to uh, get their own interests uh, in there, in the political system, having a system that has proved that it is bankrupt, institutionally didn't work, the army didn't perform well, and that's not the fault of the 20 year olds who went and fought with all their might, it's the fault of those who basically were supposed to be responsible for them, of a political administration that gives the impression that it's my way or the highway. And that is not the way to work in a country that has just come out of a war where it has tasted the bitter, bitter reality of defeat. So if I were to say anything, and if I were to leave any message, the links, you can see them. The coronavirus uh, stats, you can follow them. Uh, the uh, surveys, you can uh, log on and uh, read them and uh, learn something about different reactions. But this is serious because if there is a breach between the diaspora and the Republic, and if this breach is not healed properly, wisely, with people from the Republic realizing that there is more at stake that they, than their own futures, whomever that could be. I'm not targeting the prime minister, Nikol Pashinyan. I'm not targeting the former oligarchs. I'm not targeting only people like Robert Kocharyan who wants to run in the elections if they happen again. I'm talking about everyone. If we don't uh, hold hands together, and if we don't try to heal the wounds, within Armenia itself. The poor people in Armenia who were fed stories of victory and optimism every day of the war for six weeks, and then one day they wake up, and what are they told? A whole reversal of that narrative with, oh, we're defeated, we've lost X, Y, and Z, and we're suing for peace. That's difficult. But it's even more difficult for people living outside in one sense, because they are removed from the daily realities and their own romantic notions, as well as practical understanding of the Republic is shaken. So if there is a message to be told in number 14 of my episodes today, it is the following. Armenians everywhere, but certainly Armenians in Armenia, you are the central government, you are the uh, people with the levers of power in the government to determine your fate. You are the people who take the decisions, not us living in uh, California, Beirut, um, Brussels, Paris, London, uh, Sydney, or wherever else. Think about it. Think about the future of the country. Don't only think about your own future. I leave you with this message. In my other uh, episodes, when I talk about the Middle East, North Africa, and Gulf region, uh, friends of mine, associates of mine, colleagues of mine know that I like using a word that was coined in one of the uh, Arabic novels by a Palestinian author. The word is pessoptimism. It's a combination of pessimism and optimism. If I were to look at what's happening in uh, uh, Armenia today, and in this organic relationship between Armenians in the wide diaspora and in the small republic, if I look at that message behind me, which reads rather vaguely, diaspora is part of Armenia, 
I am pessimistic. optimistic I'm pessimistic optimistic because the pessimism relates to the fact that we're not getting our, getting our act together. To get our act together, we need to have the goodwill and the ability, the intent to do so. But I'm also optimistic because I know that in our history as Armenians, we have actually conquered many, many defeats, many setbacks and have moved forward. Will we be able to apply that again to this occasion? Or would the truce, the agreement of the 9th of November and the loss of part of Nagorno-Karabakh herald further losses, further defeats, and much more pain? I really hope not. Take care stay safe and here is for hope yours as well as mine